All of you, welcome to the third Worldwide Academy technical webinar on light characters. No surprise, we asked the legend of light, Mr. Malcolm Nicholson, to present on this topic. Malcolm is part of the Ayala family for 20 years and the last eight years as a chairman of the ENG committee working group on light and vision. He is the global product manager for Sea Light and contributing to the Sea Light's global master classes and technical training programs for aids to navigation managers. Malcolm, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Jaredine. And um, it's an absolute pleasure um, <clears throat> to be able to present what is, I hope, a lecture and a presentation with um, some good practical examples that I've gained over the years. Um, so if you're uh, privileged enough um, to be able to study the Aton Manager course through the Academy, um, this lecture is is given within the uh, within the academy, um, and I have been given this presentation, and I've I've kind of added to it and enhanced to it. Um, but should you go and do your Aton Manager training, which I can thoroughly recommend, um, you should come out with a detailed understanding of rhythmic characters, lights used in the NBS, <coughs> an understanding of the periods, uh, synchronization of lights, why we do it and the vertical divergence. So in order for a light to be seen, it needs to have a, a certain amount of divergence. Um, and there's some good practical reasons for that. Now, Ayala publications are your friends. Um, so for the purposes of this presentation, uh, you're going to need the Ayala MBS, which I'm sure you've all got a copy of. R110 uh, on rhythmic characters. Uh, the guideline on the selection of rhythmic characters, uh, 1065 on signal beam divergence. Guideline 1135 is the latest production from our, uh, our working group, our engineering committee. Um, and it's great to see so many of my working group online. I hope they, they don't pull me up for any technical details at the end, um, but it's great to see them all out there. So, um, how do you go about presenting a flash character? Well, it's relatively easy. Um, you have a, a period when the light is lit or the flash and a period of when it's dark or the eclipse period. And combining the two will give you the overall period. So in this example, uh, the light is on or flashing for one second and it's in darkness or eclipse uh, for four seconds. So the overall period is five seconds. So it's a flash five or flash five S for five seconds. Uh, and I'm going to show you uh, how that's entered into the list of lights in a moment. There's some more complicated characters um, that you can produce, such as a, a group occulting light here. Uh, but essentially, you shouldn't be looking at eclipse periods for less than 150 milliseconds uh, because it can be confused, certainly at a distance, uh, as a fixed light. Uh, and the period, the overall period, or the period of darkness, shouldn't be more than eight seconds. And that's more specific for boys, uh, and we'll cover lighthouses uh, a bit later on because that's a more historical progression and used for landfall. So classifications of rhythms. Um, essentially, there's only four characters. You can have an occulting character uh, where the light is longer than the eclipse. You can have an isophase character where the light is equal, darkness and lightness, such as an isophase four seconds, two seconds on, two seconds off. And then you can have a flashing light. Now, within a flashing light, you can have a single flashing light, you can have long flashing light, you can have group and composite flashing, continuous quick, very quick. Um, but essentially, they're all single flashing or flashing lights. And then you can have a Morse code light, which we use very sparingly. Uh, I think we only use um, U, A and Y. 
um, A is generally used for safe watermark, uh, which again we will come on to. So this is how they're represented within a list of lights. Now I've picked a, a random one here. This is a uh, Panama. Um, incidentally, if if you don't know, um, we might put this link in the chat later on. Um, this is a link to all the list of lights globally. Um, so you can go in there, you can select it. It has all the up to date notice to mariners. Uh, but what you'll see here is the list of lights number, its name and its location. So for example, this is the entrance of the rear uh, front range light. Um, its geographical position, its character, in this case it's fixed green, height above sea level, its range 14 miles, um, and then some comments on it or um, some sort of description on it. So these first three, it's a triple leading line, the first two are fixed, and the rear is an occulting uh, green where it's on for three seconds and off for half a second. Now I'll come back to this later on when we deal with port entry lights. Um, they've also put in here a couple of aviation lights, uh, which is kind of why I wanted to highlight this because mariners should, should use all available means um, to navigate. Um, so it kind of makes sense if there's a big aviation tower, um, you can use it for navigation. Um, just to highlight here, Isla Sanoa, uh, this is a character we see very often, which I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, flash white. It's periods five seconds, flash for half a second, off for four and a half seconds. Here's another little list of lights. Uh, some of these are a bit more complicated. So Hurst Point on the southeast coast of England. Uh, this is on the entrance into Portsmouth, opposite the Isle of Wight. Um, it has a lighthouse that has a flash for white red, with, so it has a red sector. Uh, short flash period over 15 seconds. So it has a just over eight second uh, eclipse period, um, but it also has a port entry light that has a much greater range, um, and that's to bring the larger vessels in on that channel. But you can see further down this list, uh, for example, here we've got a quick red. Now there's no period or eclipse, uh, but from your list of characters, a quick red is sort of 120 flashes per minute. Uh, or 60, 60 to 120, so it's one flash every second. So there's a bit of leeway in the amount of flash period and the eclipse, um, and you can use that to your advantage to save a bit of power. So <clears throat> how do we choose a character? So you either choose a character when you're re-engineering or replacing an aid to navigation, or you're establishing a new aid to navigation. Uh, and that may be because the volume of traffic and the degree of risk might have increased and you need to perform a risk assessment. Uh, now, Ayala have three different methods of uh, doing the risk assessments. Um, they have the IRAP, the POSA or the CIRA. Uh, and if you've never done one before, uh, you can have a go at the CIRA risk assessment, the simplified risk assessment. And really what you need to be doing is going out to your users, uh, your stakeholder feedback, pilots, ferry captains, fishermen, leisure user, even your maintenance guys. Go out to see your maintenance guys. What's causing issues there? Why are you renewing it? <clears throat> so your external stakeholders are going to care about range, character and conspicuity. So your pilots, your ferry captains, your fishermen, your leisure users, that's what they're going to care about. But your internal stakeholders, maybe your boss, is going to bear, care about cost, maintenance, how you're going to install it, how you're going to deploy it. So you need to have a mixture of both of these put into your risk assessment. And whatever you do, you must document your process. Even if it's a couple of lines, we changed the light on this boy from uh, a tungsten lamp to an LED. It's the same range, it's the same character, but we changed it because the pilots and the ferry captains wanted the same character and the same range. Write it down and write it down for two reasons. It's a reminder of why you did it. 
So in the future, you can go back to it and you can look at it and say, ah, I remember why we did this. But also you can use it as a business case. So if you are moving from your traditional halogen or tungsten filament uh, lanterns to LED, they, they may cost slightly more, but it may reduce your maintenance period. And so you can very quickly build a, quite a robust business case as to why you're doing it. And at least you've written it down and then you can refer back to it. When somebody comes back at the end of the year and says, oh, you've spent so many dollars on a light, you can justify it with your risk assessment process. So I would urge you all, if you're re-engineering or establishing new aids to navigation, perform a risk assessment. And Ayala or, or many manufacturers out there will be more than happy to assist you and help you in that process. Now, <clears throat> Once you've done that, of course, there are specific rules that apply to buoys, uh, and hence why the maritime buoyage system was developed and published and harmonized uh, as much as we possibly could globally. Um, we don't need to have any discussions about region A and B, uh, but essentially you have your cardinal marks that indicate safe water uh, to the direction that it's being placed. So, for example, a north cardinal mark, the safe water is to the north of that mark, um, and that is a quick flash white or a very quick flash. And then it forms the face of a clock face. Uh, east cardinal is three o'clock, hence three quick flashes. A south cardinal is at six o'clock, hence six flashes plus a long flash, and a west cardinal mark is nine flashes in succession. So as I said, the quick rate is 50 to 60 flashes per minute. Very quick is 100 to 120 um, and you can use either. <coughs> Safe water mark, you, you have a choice of characters. Uh, predominantly Morse A is used to signify a safe water mark. Uh, Morse A is uh, dot dash. So a short flash followed by an eclipse followed by a long flash um, and you can choose your eclipse period. Uh, isolated danger is a group flash two. And a composite group flash for a preferred channel is a group flash two plus one. So it has a longer eclipse. And I want to use this splendid diagram that is all in the back of your Maritime Boys system leaflets. Um, this took us quite a while to uh, redevelop <clears throat> when I was uh, vice chair of uh, the working group that dealt with the last revision of the maritime buoyed system. Um, so if you're a vessel coming in on, on this line here, the first thing you will see perhaps 18 to 20 miles off would be this lighthouse here. Uh, and that's a, a a landfall lighthouse if you like, or you're in the coastal phase of navigation. So you're 20 miles offshore, you've got plenty of deep water around you, you can take a bearing on that lighthouse, you're coming in, and then the next mark you will see will be the safe water mark. Uh, perhaps you may see this at nine or 10 miles out, um, that they normally have that kind of range. Uh, and that'll have the Morse character on here, and then when you come in close, you're going to start to see your front gated pair of lateral buoys that are synchronized. And I'm going to touch on synchronization later on. So then you make your way at the channel. If you're a large vessel, you will you'll take this route uh, and you'll get to this point here. And no doubt you'll be directed into the harbor area here or into perhaps a larger port here on a set of leading lines here and then into the port entry here and otherwise you're going to come in this way into this harbour and you've got a couple of pier end lateral marks and uh, a port entry sector light coming in here. Preferred channel may be for leisure craft and fishing, fishing vessels that are coming in here and going up this route here. Uh, you may not have the need uh, for lit beacons here but again your leisure user or your fishing user might increase and you may choose to light these uh, and then you have a choice of LED technology range character. 
there are some specific rules that we outline in uh, R110 uh, with regards to flashing characters. Now, your eclipse period um, should be a minimum of three times the length of the lit period, i.e. if you have a one second flash, uh, the eclipse should be three seconds. Um, period should be greater than two seconds overall, which is absolutely fine. And if you're using a long flash, perhaps more for port entry rather than voyage, it should be greater than two seconds. Now, there are other rules here, uh, generally talking about uh, length of light and length of eclipse period. I won't go through them all, but like I said before, isophase here, um, it should be greater than two seconds. So your minimum isophase character should be isophase four. Um, there are rules regarding Morse. Um, so uh, your dots should be point second and your dash should be three times the dot. So in our preferred channel, uh, we we or in our Morse. <coughs> in our Morse A for our safe water mark, our dot is going to be 0.5 and our dash is going to be 1.5. Um, there are a couple of other characters that are quite specific. You can use the emergency rec mark. That's a very, very specific character in that it's on for one second in blue, off for half a second and then on for one second in yellow, which is an alternating blue yellow character. Um, there are other alternating characters, uh, but use them with with caution. Now I just want to take a minute. Um, I've put this in here for a lot of the, the, the sort of maintenance guys and the more practical guys um, out there. Now you can have your flash character and you can publish your flash character and of course you can publish your period and your flash length. Um, but I just wanted to mention here about duty cycle. Uh, duty cycle is the percentage time that the light is lit. And of course that has a profound effect on the power that it consumes during that flash period. So for example, if we take a, a one second flash in a, in a five second character, if you reduce it to half a second, you, you're almost reducing it to 50% of power. Now you need a higher peak intensity to retain the effective intensity. This is for a five mile light, by the way, so you need an effective intensity of 77 candela, but you only need a slightly larger peak. So effectively, you can half your power. Um, and that's really good for self-contained lanterns. Um, but any reduction in flash length should not affect the primary purpose of the aid to navigation. That's very important to know. Very important to know. So when we're talking about flash lengths um, <clears throat> and eclipse periods and power consumptions, uh, most manufacturers nowadays, and in fact even Ayala, have a free to download uh, solar calculator. Uh, here's an example of, of, of the sea light solar, uh, solar calculator. Um, it gives you a couple of options. Uh, you can uh, know your product or you can go into help me decide where um, you have a set of prerequisite requirements such as a five mile white uh, flashing light. Um, and this will help you decide what lanterns are available uh, to give. Um, so in this example, we'll continue the, the flash five second character in white uh, with an effective range of, of five nautical miles. And here we see it one second off, uh, one second on, four seconds off, 20% duty cycle, dusk till dawn. Um, and this is up in the Shetland Islands. You can put your location in. Um, and we've got GPS on this one as well for synchronization. Now you'll see here it will give you an autonomy figure, <clears throat> but the important factor to look at is the charge extra, the surplus charge. Now you're actually getting a negative surplus charge in, in the first year in December. Now this does take account dark days, <clears throat> uh, and there is a bit of a misnomer about autonomy. Autonomy was a figure kind of banded about um, 
for the, the worst access to a particular station, which might be up to two weeks. So they ensured that they had uh, power capacity for two weeks of no charge. Um, now, in reality, uh, that's not strictly true because you always have daylight. There are you do have dark days, um, but there is normal daylight, so you will get some charge um, unless, of course, there is actually a failure in the system. But simply by halving the flash character, what you can see here is we've increased the autonomy, but we've also put that negative charge extra into positive. So it's certainly something worth considering but like i said it should not affect the primary navigational reason for that aton okay <clears throat> that's boys kind of covered short characters short periods instant recognition recognition relatively short ranges so you'll see them coming on once certainly between one and five seconds normally you know your lateral gated pair of boys at the start of your channel, you maybe have it one, one, two second period. Um, when we move into port entry lights, um, generally speaking, they're either fixed, long flashing, isophase or occulting. Now there's some historical reasons for that because, uh, and certainly Omar alluded to it in the beginning, when we first started doing this, we, we had uh, baskets with fire in it. So essentially it was it was a fixed light um, and then came along the electric lamp. Uh, we didn't have flashes, so we had a steady burning lamp. Uh, and then somebody said, well, if we put one in front of the other, we can have a leading line that people can come on and take a bearing. And then, of course, we developed street lighting. So our leading line became obscured through the massive street lighting. So then we started to put red filters in front of them so they would be more conspicuous, so they would stand out from the normal white street lighting. So that's the historical the development, um, and it's really because mariners take a bearing on it. They need to come in on that line, and that's why they need to see it, and they need to constantly see it. I would say nowadays, though, you could probably, with synchronization, you could probably go to a shorter character um, and have the light synchronized and that would the short flash would make it stand out. Now you might have a, a quick flash, for example, um, which might be quite effective, uh, but uh, we are quite a conservative uh, industry uh, and pilots uh, and mariners generally don't like change um, and they like things to be just as so. Um, and hence why we keep these characters. Uh, but he'd be interested to find out if anybody has done uh, <clears throat> a quick flash set of leading lines. That would be quite good. So just give you a, a bit of an example um, from Australia, actually, uh, or a case study of a port entry light and how it was used. <coughs> now, this was quite interesting. Um, Port of Gladstone in, in Australia, um, it's quite a big bulk carrier on the west coast uh, and it exports and, and takes in a lot of iron ore and a lot of mining. Um, so there's a lot of traffic coming in and out and they have uh, a leading line, which is a departure line and an approach line as well. Uh, it's quite a complicated bit of waterway uh, with a lot of traffic and so it's the channel, the approach channel is slightly different to the departure lane uh, of where these ships come in and where they leave. Um, so it's quite an interesting project and you're talking about 80,000 tonnes here in relatively shallow water uh, and it was quite a challenge with the infrastructure uh, in that it had to be put on top of this 60 metre grain silo, um, but it made a suitable platform. So this is the chart here, it's relatively complicated. Um, so you've got the main channel coming on this way um, and then you've got the departure lane coming out this way and this was the this was what they wanted to mark here. Um, so the ideal situation was for them to come out on a quick flash green, 
going into a flashing green, going into isophase, going into occulting, going into fixed, then going into your occulting white and then into a fixed white as the middle of the channel. Um, and of course, we can do this nowadays with modern technology, uh, with LED technology. Uh, these lights have 10 individual LEDs that represent half a degree each, um, and they can, can be controlled individually uh, with each different character. So as they're transiting out here on a departure, the, the, the green starts flashing quickly, and then once they get into the white, they can take this, this bearing line up here. So that's particularly challenging, uh, but a great result. <coughs> now, uh, characters for lighthouses. Now, they were historically developed for range because uh, they marked landfall and they wanted to be long range, so they wanted to be to the horizon. Uh, so vessels are just coming over the horizon. They're still in the ocean phase of navigation and they're entering the coastal phase of navigation. Still plenty of water. They can still take a bearing on it because it's quite a long distance away. Um, so the, the bearing line doesn't change very much. Um, uh, but they do have quite long eclipse periods. Um, and that is because the light is collected from a single source. Uh, and the rotation of the optic provides the flash length and the range over those huge lighthouse projectors um, so that's where you get the range um, so historically there's, there's quite a large um, eclipse period in those because the character is determined by the rotation of the optic um, and you don't want um, six tons of glass and brass rotating at five rpm um, that might have some effect on the structure but while i was doing this um, <clears throat> it took me back um, to a presentation that was given by our old engineering committee, Lef Arnie Larson, and he gave this presentation in 2012. And it, it, when I was asked to do this, this really reminded me um, of the dangers that it can cause. So he gave an example, um, and this was a fast ferry coming in through the fjords through Norway. Uh, this was back in November. Uh, 1991. Uh, there was a gale, a gale force uh, six, seven. Um, it was a bit cloudy with some rain showers. It was, it was dark, um, but they could see. Now, what happened was he he missed the first flash of the character from from this uh, beacon here. He missed the second flash. He missed the third flash. And he only observed the fourth flash here. Now, when he gets to this point, this is where he starts first to see it. Now, he's lost the flash again, so he turns hard to pour when he's actually seen the light. And then he considers at this point here whether he's going to make the turn in time. Decides to perform a crash maneuver. Both engines full astern, warns the the bridge watch to take hold of something, and they actually hit this island at 34 knots. Now, unfortunately, two passengers died, uh, and there was a number injured. Uh, but the result of that was in the Norwegian administration is they did a full review uh, of their aids to navigation, and what they actually came up with. Um, is high speed craft indication lighting whereby uh, the tower is either lit uh, directly uh, by an LED or indirectly by flood lighting. Uh, and this solves a lot of problems for them. Uh, but bear in mind that this, this was in the mid, mid 90s or early 2000s when they dis did this. And of course, technology has, has moved along. Uh, quite rapidly since then. But you can see how many they replaced. Uh, this is nigh on 900 lights that they've replaced uh, with this type of fixture. Um, and the users actually love it because they have a, a fixed component uh, and then the flashing light uh, on top of it. 
So leading on to characters that should be used it with care, the, the fixed and flashing is one. Um, it can be very effective um, to have a low level fixed component. Um, but you should only use about 1% of the peak intensity of the flash. Um, so you will, you have quite a short range with that fixed component. Uh, and then the, the, the flashing component is superimposed on the top um, to identify the aid. Uh, ultra flashing um, is something to be aware of as well. Um, strobing effect, um, it can be quite effective. Uh, but it can also cause some disturbance. Uh, I've mentioned alternating uh, flash characters as well, generally reserved for the emergency rec marking, um, and try to avoid green and blue lights with high flash rates, high repetition rate short flashes. Uh, they can be uh, confused, <clears throat> not necessarily by the observer, but by atmospheric conditions can change and be absorbed. Uh, and they can be confused. So there are some maximum periods as we've discussed and, and this comes straight from uh, the recommendation and as part of the lecture. So maximum periods uh, for various different classes of character. So you see here a group flash of three which may be a lighthouse. So you might have a, a, a flash three uh, 30 seconds. And of course, that will depend on the rotational period. Now, our uh, talk about synchronization of lights, and of course, this is when two or light, two or more lights flash together. It's it's been in use for, for leading lines, certainly with a hardwire sync, a hardwire between them, um, has been in use for several years. Uh, but on boys, it's 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 relatively new, I'd say, ten years, uh, but it is such an advantage. Um, it gives you that three, dim three dimensional spatial awareness. Uh, it does require GNSS uh, reception for timing, uh, but you do only need one satellite for timing. Uh, you probably need three, a minimum of three, perhaps four for positional data, GPS positional data. Uh, but just for a timing signal, uh, you only need one satellite. And the, the crystal on the circuit board um, should give you uh, 20 odd minutes uh, of synchronization uh, until it gets another timing signal. So your GPS may pick up a timing signal every five minutes or every 10 minutes, uh, depending on what setting you have it on. Uh, but generally they'll, they'll synchronize uh, for at least 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, they're very effective. Uh, and I'm very, very grateful uh, to my colleague uh, Partel uh, Keskula from the Estonian uh, administration who, who sent me through some details last night. He is on the call, so if you have any questions for him afterwards, uh, you can ask him. Uh, but this is a, a chartlet uh, of an area within Estonian waters between two islands, I believe. Uh, and here is the channel. Now you'll see it's very shallow water either side. You've only got a meter or so either side. Uh, so we have a set of range lights leading lines here, marking the, the center of the channel. And we have a number of pairs of lateral buoys. Now the challenge here is, is the turn. This is a, quite a tight turn around this bend here. Um, so what he did is he actually put it into a simulator. Now, this next slide shows two simulations and I'm just going to go through them. Uh, I might spend a bit of time on this slide and we'll go back and forth. But this top slide shows the two laterals here. From the starting point here. So this shows the two laterals here and nothing is synchronized in this and then the second pair here. And then this is where it goes up to the turn and you'll see your leading lights here. Now, if you concentrate on this top one for a minute, you'll see it's quite difficult to make out where the turn might be. Now, Partel did a lot of different exercises and what he decided on was the first two gated pairs, these two and these two, 
they should be synchronized. So if we look in the bottom one here, these four lights now are synchronized. And then there's a one and a half second delay, sync dis delay to the second part of where the turning is. So these aids to navigation here, and this makes it a very, very effective solution. So you can play with simulation and you can test out your characters uh, and you can even get your pilots in to look at a simulation and say, what do you think of this? Do you, do you like it? Perhaps we could have some changes here. Perhaps we could do some simulations on the character of the leading line. Uh, what do you think? Uh, but Partel did a number of simulations uh, and the, the first four were synchronized with the second part with the turning with a one and a half second sync delay proved um, to be the winning combination. Um, so if you can simulate a new synchronization, um, it's absolutely fantastic. Now, just to touch on vertical divergence, you'll find all the information you need in guideline 1065. So to be effective, an ATON must be able to be detected, recognized and identified. The observer's eye is normally in line with the beam, um, but we have some divergence, horizontal as well as vertical, um, so that the mariner can be within the beam uh, during the character. Now, fixed aids to navigation, it's never really a problem. Uh, certainly trials I did back when I was at uh, the GLAs in the UK, it was actually only uh, a quarter of a degree uh, that you needed. Uh, and you were always within within that beam. Um, I think we recommend a minimum of half a degree for fixed eight on, uh, but certainly with boys, it's a little bit different because you've got pitch and roll and surge and heave and tide uh, and all sorts of factors that, that go on uh, with voyage. I guess you would say, generally speaking, when you're coming into port and harbors, into estuaries, um, it's more the tidal flow that's an issue rather than the swell or the waves. Uh, but when you're going out to safe water marks, um, certainly with a range of nine or ten miles off the lantern, uh, you're going to need a good sort of six or seven metres height above sea level for it to be seen at that distance. <clears throat> and so you need quite a large diameter buoy, at least a 2.6 or a three metre and then you'll need to consider the mooring uh, within that as well. Um, so there are some of the factors uh, to look at within vertical divergence of buoys. Um, I hope you found this interesting. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much. Um, many of you will know Simon Milliard, the chairman of the engineering committee. He was gr uh, gracious enough to do a presentation for us the other week and he included some pictures uh, of his travels around the world. So I thought I'd do the same. Um, this is me here starting out my career fixing lighthouses for the Northern Lighthouse Board some 20 plus years ago. Here's me doing a site survey. I think that was in Australia in uh, 2010, 2015. And this is me with my garden light giving it a good polish and a clean um, some weeks ago. So. Back to you, Geraldine, and we'll open the discussions and questions. Thank you, Malcolm. Yes, I found it uh, hilarious to be in a meeting with you in your garden virtually and see that you have lanterns in your garden. I always try to convince my husband, no anchors, no pieces of ships in the garden, please. <laughs> so I wonder uh, how your wife thinks about it, but very interesting. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, a very good presentation and um, uh, enlightening us on the subject. I am very happy also that you pointed out uh, the importance of risk assessments and please take care of all your users. So also a fisherman is important and a yacht is important. So we have to please them all and make sure they can navigate safely. Yes, well, that brings us to the official end of the webinar. Uh, many thanks to all of you for joining and special thanks to our excellent speaker. And I now officially close this webinar. Thanks a lot.